the first talk of the afternoon to talk to us about Cooperberg's pollination for versus uh, seasides. Uh, yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome back uh, from lunch. Um, so this is the shore of uh, the Cesar Chavez Park uh, down here in Berkeley. Uh, but sometimes when you do quantum, you want to go to the shore, and sometimes you want to go to, to Cooperberg, right? All right. So uh, there we go. That's the matter. OK, so I'll start with the conclusions, um, just the bottom line um, and what this is all about. So the, the, the talk and the work is about the concrete uh, cost of uh, Cooperberg algorithm on various uh, seaside parameters that have been proposed. And uh, the, the kind of top line conclusion is that the parameters that were proposed are offering you relatively little quantum security uh, beyond the cost of uh, quantumly evaluating the, uh, the group action itself uh, on a uniform superposition. Okay, so what do we mean by this? Well, for example, uh, for Seaside 512, which was, which was the lowest uh, proposal, uh, lowest parameters proposed, um, you can do this key recovery in about 2 to the 16 evaluations of the oracle uh, if you use about 2 to the 40 bits of uh, what's called quantum accessible RAM and relatively small other computational resources. So 2 to the 40 bits is uh, 128 gigabytes, which uh, I think I have in my laptop. Um, so that's a, a pretty small amount, uh, although you do have to make it quantum accessible, and I'll talk about uh, that. Um, so the main um, you know, con conclusions from the work have to do with the number of oracle calls that you have to make for, uh, for this, these Cooperberg style uh, civ attacks. Uh, but people also want to know, okay, what does that mean actually for the, the concrete security claims? So I will say uh, something like this. If you make the assumption that uh, these oracle evaluations do not cost much more than the, for the best case, uh, which, which Chloe was telling us about, uh, in, the, in the talk pr prior to this, before lunch. Uh, if under this assumption, you end up with some, um, some rough estimates like this, uh, CSAD 512 would be breakable with about two to the 60 uh, T gates and other uh, cheaper uh, Clifford gates. And that would mean that it would fall well short of the claimed or targeted NIST level one uh, post-quantum security. Uh, so for NIST level one, you need to be secure against attacks by uh, quantum circuits with at least two to the 170 over max depth uh, circuit, uh, sorry, T gates or quantum gates. And um, max depth is said to range reasonably between two to the 40 and two to the 96. So if you plug this in, uh, you need to be quite a bit above the, the two to the 60 threshold uh, that, that we would get here. Uh, so you could say, okay, well, what if we would go to higher parameters, uh, CSED 1024? Um, it turns out the, the numbers don't change all that much, they go up you know, a little bit, moderately, but uh, not too much. So now, for example, we can do breaking it with two to the 72 T gates and about two to the 44 bits uh, of this quantum accessible RAM. Uh, that also leaves it short of, of level one. Uh, if you go up higher, um, 1792 was also proposed, actually proposed for NIST level three, um, but it turns out you can break it with about two to the 84 T gates in uh, this much key RAM. Uh, or key rackham, basically. Uh, this puts it kind of close or a little uncomfortably close uh, to whether it reaches level one or not. Uh, it's not totally clear what the conclusion is here because at the high end of max depth uh, of, of two to the 96, uh, this is more than you need, but at lower ends of max depth, uh, this is less than what you're supposed to be secure against. Yeah. Can you remind the exact definition of level one? The exact definition of level one is as, as secure as AES-128 key search. Yeah. And this guidance says this is what they estimate uh, AES-128 key search is. Yeah, why is it not 2 to 64? Because that, uh, the key search has to actually count the cost of the AES oracle as well. Uh, I looked up the estimates. The AES oracle is about a million, like, or Sorry, two to the 20 T gates or so, I guess, is uh, according to the estimate I saw, with a depth of two to the 15. So there's a big substantial um, cost just to evaluate AES in the context of a quantum key search. And then there's also NIST has this restriction on max depth, which says we actually want to consider attacks which have some bound on how deep they are. Um, and so between two to the 40 on the low end and two to the 96 is the, the range of parameters. And if you limit the depth of your quantum attack, your AES key search is actually slower and, and worse. Right? So in order to match the AES key, uh, key search hardness, 
this is what NIST uh, is, is advising um, US departments. Uh, I have one question. So QRACM, is that what other people call QRAM? Or is that, that's Some call it QROM, Q-R-O-M, so quantum read-only memory. Um, uh, Cooperbird's paper, Greg, he uses the, the uh, QRACM. So that's quantum, randomly accessible, classical memory. Right? So it's ordinary bits, like on the, you know, the RAM of your laptop, but uh, the abstraction is that you can access it in superposition so that, that you can address it with a quantum state. And then the lookup gives you back a quantum state, which is a, like a superposition of the uh, memory contents. And so when you're converting this to T-gates, do you account for the quantum circuits? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so these estimates here include the cost of implementing uh, QRACM okay. uh, with ordinary RAM and a very simple linear search over, over the RAM. Uh, there's a paper by a big group from Google from a couple years ago which tells you you can do this qu quite modest uh, cost. Basically, four times the number of cells in the QRACM is the number of T-gates in there. Yeah. How does the talk from yesterday, which fell with this 170, uh, kind of affect the conclusion? Because all post-quantum schemes are more secure because AES is cheaper, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, one way to be as secure as AES is to just break AES quantumly. And now everybody is as secure as AES. Uh, so, so this could be a bit of a moving target. Uh, I don't know the, you know, the current, you know, state of the art on this, but uh, 157. 157. Okay. Uh, doesn't change this conclusion. I don't know if it changes this conclusion. Probably not. At least not at the low end of max step. Uh, it may. It might change this assessment here. Yeah. So that's the conclusion. Yes. Yeah, so then you'd have to redo the, the analysis. Um, the NIST, you know, guidance, I'm going by what the NIST guidance uh, says, which is they count the quantum gates. Um, I'm also treating T gates as more expensive than other linear Clifford gates. Uh, the number of linear gates is, is comparable to what you see here, so that's not going to be uh, a substantial difference here. Um, yeah. But there could be like a gate that's, that requires many T gates to be simulated. Indeed, yeah. Uh, and then your accounts, <coughs> it may affect the counts here. Yeah, or vice versa. So again, uh, the focus of the talk and the work is actually not on this at all. Uh, I'm just plugging in the known uh, bounds that we have for the, for the evaluation of the uh, Oracle, because um, people want to know. But uh, it's actually not like what I'm doing here. Uh, it's not what the work is about. Um, so, you know, if you prefer a different model or a different count for the, what NIST level one means or what a different, uh, different evaluation method for the Oracle, you would get potentially different conclusions. Yes. I just wanted to say in response to the question of alternate models that, that when, I, when I first thought about QRACO, which actually was just separately from, from this stuff, just philosophically, it seemed like there could be various alternate uh, architectures specific to QRACM and that it, it should be separate accounting and that it could, in fact, be, for all I know, much cheaper than these estimates. The only thing is that when I've asked experimentalists, they have no particular ideas at this time. So, so if anything, if you want to say alternate architectures, these methods could be even more effective uh, because, because, because who knows how cheap QRACM could be. Yeah, that's, I, th I think that's an important part. We have an upper bound on how much QRACM costs. Uh, that, that's been established. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a model, it's a memory model of its own that it's kind of, you know, you could just treat it as a, a complexity resource, as, as Greg said. Uh, so that's why I want to focus on like item, statements of the form item two here saying how many evaluations and how much QRACM do you need to, uh, to have a successful attack. Okay. So uh, good. So we've already uh, seen this morning, so I'll go relatively quickly over the background. But um, so Seaside uh, by Castric, Longa, Martindale, Pani, and Rennes uh, is this commutative group action. And uh, we have an abelian group G and some arbitrary set Z. And the action I'll denote by star, it takes from uh, an element of G, an element of Z into, into Z. And um, I just want to point out that uh, SIDH, uh, like David was telling us about earlier, is uh, different. It doesn't fall into this framework. There's, uh, not, there's really no group action 
Uh, there's not an abelian uh, group at all. But it allows you to get Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange as we saw before lunch. Um, the important thing is that uh, one's public key would be like A star Z and B star Z for some public parameter Z. And then the shared key you would get uh, is A plus B times Z. I'm using additive notation for the group. So that just falls out. And uh, what's cool about Seaside, you get this, this pretty good efficiency, uh, especially in terms of space. So you have 64-byte uh, keys, for example. And then I guess the 80 needs to be updated. It's gotten a little faster, 50 or 60 milliseconds. Okay. And then there have also been signature proposals uh, that have come out of this in, in recent years, uh, starting from uh, Stolbanov's uh, ideas. And um, there, the public key plus the signature size is smaller than all the current uh, NIST proposals for post-quantum signatures. So in terms of size of, of you know, ciphertext or signatures or keys, this is doing quite well. Uh, especially relative to the competition. So how do we attack uh, Seaside quantumly? So the statement that we're gonna go after is, is uh, secret key recovery. So given the base point or the, the public parameter Z and then someone's public key A star Z, we'd like to find uh, their secret key A or some equivalent of it. And uh, I guess David wanted to credit this to Greg, but Greg didn't want the credit. Uh, it seems to me the credit has typically gone to this paper by Chalds, Chow, and uh, Sukarev which shows how to do the secret key recovery uh, by reducing to this hidden shift problem. Right? So uh, we'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but it, what, what, what can we do with hidden shift? Well, uh, starting with Cooperberg in 03, uh, there are these algorithms that will solve uh, hidden shift problems efficiently, or sorry, not efficiently, quantumly. quantumly. Um, so the basic structure of these algorithms is that we have some kind of oracle which is out, going to output these random labeled quantum states. Okay, so you get, you get a quantum state and you get some label that the oracle gives you. And the oracle does this by evaluating the group action on uh, some uniform superposition over the group. And then there's some sieve algorithm which will combine these labeled states in various ways intelligently uh, to generate somehow more favorable states or nicer states. And finally, once the states have been made very nice, uh, then we do some measurement um, on this very favorable state to recover uh, one or more bits of the hidden shift, which is the secret key. So that's the general structure. Uh, and then there have been various algorithms uh, fitting under the structure. So Cooperberg's original takes uh, two to the order square root little n uh, oracle queries and quantum bits. Uh, this little n is the log of the, of the group size. Uh, soon after, Regev gave a, 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 a variant of this uh, algorithm, which um, uses only polynomial number of, of quantum bits. So this, there's an exponential improvement in the quantum space, uh, but some in, increase in the exponent uh, in the number of oracle queries. And then uh, a follow-up, so the third algorithm uh, by Cooperberg first, uh, first put out in uh, late 2011, uh, manages to get uh, two to the, back to the two to the square root n, order square root n oracle queries, uh, but not qubits anymore, but rather bits of uh, QRACM. So still we're in this, uh, or maybe we're kind of in this middle ground of it's not quite classical memory, it's not quite quantum memory, it's mostly classical with a, with a quantum twist to it. Right? So, uh, and, and you're back down to this asymptotically smaller regime of uh, number of oracle queries. Okay, so that's the, the kind of top line uh, results or complexities of these algorithms. But if you look uh, a bit closer, and, and, and Cooperberg actually points this out in his paper, that uh, this third algorithm here actually subsumes the prior two. Um, the other two come out as, as instantiations of it. Uh, and it also offers more trade-offs among the parameters. And one trade-off that uh, we'll really kind of squeeze a lot of juice out of is this trade-off, which is that you can essentially, as long as this equation holds, so as long as the log of your number of queries times the log of your amount of QRACM is roughly exceeding n, then uh, your, the sieve will, will work. So what we'll do is, is get some, some leverage out of the case where, okay, if our queries are very expensive, then you really want to drive the number of queries down. Uh, you can do that by uh, correspondingly lifting up the amount of, of QRACM that's available. And then it's a balancing act. Uh, but you know, when queries are very expensive, QRACM is probably not that expensive, or we know an upper bound on how expensive it is. And so just kind of balance these things better and 
you get a, a nicer uh, outcome. Regev's results satisfy that equation? Uh, it does not. So this, this equation is for Cooperbergs. This is a new trade-off yeah. available only in Cooperberg 11, which the prior two do not have. And that's where we're going to get some leverage. Yeah. Was that a question over here? Yeah. So that, you know, if you want to know, like, what's, what's kind of uh, the key idea or the key lever point, uh, it's, it's this kind of equation. Yeah, I don't even, I'm, I'm going to live with ARD2 for the talk, but uh, I'd be glad to talk offline about higher That would be the reason that if the regex algorithm is, uh, is off, off the curve, it, it is higher arity. It is higher arity. It's, it's, it's kind of very high arity, right? Uh, yeah. So, um, but as, as what I mean by this is that this trade off here doesn't really make sense for the prior two algorithms just because it's not even talking about key rack. Those aren't even dealing with key rackham. How much actual quantum memory do you need just enough to access the, the, the right? How much quantum memory do you need? Yeah, the third one. I mean, you obviously also need some qubits, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are, um, okay, so QRACM is classical memory. There's also associated, uh, so there's polylogarithmic quantum memory associated to this, uh, this SID as well. It's, it's quite, quite low. Right. Okay, but polylogarithmic, if this Q reckon is, is like some exponential, then it's becoming not so negligible, right? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, the, Q, the, the associated uh, qubits for for Cooperberg 11 is... Log is fine, but yeah. log is already becoming polyamic. So it's going to be log times the depth of the log, yeah. Well, most of the qubits so are in the oracle, not in the, in the separate... Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, you want to account for, if, if you want to account for how much, how many qubits the sieve itself needs, you know, we have formulas for that, um, but it's some small polylog term. Only a single factor of log for the qubit. Yeah, one, one factor of log and then times the depth, I think, of the sieve. And for holding the phase vectors, there's some, there's some log factor there. That's, that's a Separate, yeah. Okay, so that's a picture. Um, now we can apply this to Seaside, or really everything we say applies generally to any CRS-style commutative group action. So there's nothing specific to Seaside here. It just happens to be the, the proposed uh, instantiation here. So we've seen how much the oracle costs, uh, or at least an upper bound on that. Uh, that's for a, a slightly non-uniform uh, distribution. Um, so we'll go back to that. But there is some good reason to think that a similar cost should be attainable for uh, uniform superposition. Uh, I'll mention that at the end. Um, okay, so, but focusing on the sieve costs, so abstracting away the oracle, um, the original Seaside paper estimates something like two to the 62 oracle queries for Regev's low, uh, low space, uh, but higher query um, algorithm, and the sieve memory is polynomial. Um, some work by Bonnetain and Schrottenlower uh, looked at uh, Cooperberg's original algorithm and came to this number for the number of queries uh, with, a, with that many uh, qubits. And then you can ask, okay, for the third algorithm, uh, the, the one that subsumes the prior two, what's the estimate? Uh, well, there was actually none available previously. So um, that's what we're gonna you know, aim to fill, fill this gap here. Okay, so we're going to uh, generalize and give some practical improvements to uh, Cooperberg's collimation sieve, or C sieve for short, and then analyze what kind of concrete numbers you get for proposed uh, parameters. Um, the kind of what I mean by generalize and, and improve, so we managed to handle arbitrary group orders. Um, this is using tricks that were, uh, or ideas that uh, had applied to the first algorithm. Um, they kind of poured over to this, this new setting uh, of the collimation sieve. Um, so generalizing from power of two order group orders. Um, we'll show a way to recover several uh, secret bits from each run of the sieve, um, which, is, which was also done for the earlier algorithm, but, but hadn't been, uh, I don't think, written down for the new one. Um, some tricks to control the, the time complexities and the memory complexities. And we actually run some simulations uh, up to and including the exact group order of CSAD 512. So we can actually simulate 
the, the Civ algorithm, uh, or at least the classical part of it, simulate it fully um, on, on real experiments. And that's what we did. And uh, the, the takeaway is that the simulations basically comport extremely closely to the theoretical model that we give. So you can give good predictions for how many queries are needed and how much RAM is needed uh, based on these uh, simulations. Okay, so the, then the takeaway, um, I already mentioned some of these points, but um, you know, using this much QRACM, so increasing amounts of QRACM, uh, knocks down the number of Oracle queries uh, correspondingly, uh, like in this example. So if you have you know, a good deal more QRACM, then you can even get close to two to the 14 uh, Oracle queries, beating two to the 16. Any questions about this? And then it turns out that at the same time uh, we were doing this work, Bonatain and Schrottenlauer were um, extending their previous work. They give a theoretical analysis um, for a, actually a very different point on the parameter spectrum of the collimation sieve. Uh, they end up at roughly similar conclusions uh, about the complexity. Okay. So um, we've seen this before, uh, but let me just refresh on how um, a CRS style crypto system can be attacked via hidden shift. So the hidden shift problem is you have two functions from a group, additive group, to some arbitrary set Z. And these functions are related by some hidden shift S. So you have this uh, equation. And the goal is to find the shift. So Childs, Joe, and Sukarev uh, say, OK, here's how we do it. We have the base value, and we have the public key. And we just define the two functions as uh, you know, G maps to Z by just multiplying or starring uh, G into the corresponding either the base value or the public key, respectively. And you can just write out the equations. It turns out that these two functions are related by this uh, shift. And so uh, if you can solve hidden, hidden shift problem for these two functions, uh, you recover the secret key. So um, we have now these two functions, just given the public key and the, the base uh, value. And now we can, um, if you can implement the oracle, uh, for these two functions, then you can run the collimation sieve on it. So I'd like to just give you uh, kind of the main ideas behind uh, the, the update to the collimation sieve that we do. We're going to um, sieve on what we'll call the high bits rather than the low bits. And this will have uh, some advantages in terms of simplicity and handling uh, arbitrary group orders. So we have some, um, let's suppose we have some finite cyclic group of known order n. So it's isomorphic to, to Z mod N. And uh, this collimation sieve algorithm is going to work with uh, these quantum states, which are called phase vectors. And each phase vector has some uh, vector of what are called phase multipliers. Okay. So um, originally, we will be given from, from our oracle, or with a little bit of help from our oracle, we'll be given uh, fresh phase vectors. And these fresh vectors have huge random multipliers. So their multipliers are in the interval zero to n, okay, where n is the group order. And we can ask for, uh, or we can construct phase vectors of any desired uh, length L, uh, as long as we can write it down you know, feasibly with our, within our uh, QRACM. Okay. So think of this L as the amount of QRACM that you have. Okay, so you're given these initial fresh phase vectors, but they have nasty, huge multipliers. Uh, our goal is to construct a very nice phase vector, which has small multipliers. So by small, I mean uh, the multiplier should be roughly bounded by L. Okay, so we want to construct a phase vector of length L whose multipliers are also uh, less than L. Okay, so we start with these, these huge multipliers in our original phase vectors. We want to whittle them down. And uh, from this, we can extract uh, secret key. So how will we do this? We're going to make uh, nicer, progressively nicer phase vectors. Um, with multipliers that live in successively smaller uh, intervals. Okay, so we're just going to chop down the, uh, the, the range, if you will, of where the uh, multipliers live uh, by a big chunk uh, using this process called collimation. Okay, so um, any questions so far? This is kind of similar to what we've, uh, what we've seen uh, David talk about, but the new object here is these phase vectors, which will give us a lot, of, a lot more... Um, a lot more juice to squeeze. Okay, so pictorially, uh, here's the picture. Um, it's going to look something like this. 
So we can imagine uh, some binary tree or higher arity tree. But for now, let's just think about a uh, binary tree. And we're going to fix some sequence of interval sizes. So at the root, we would like to have uh, a phase vector whose multipliers are in this interval. But uh, we can only construct, at first, phase vectors whose multipliers are in this big interval here. Right? So if you imagine kind of arranging things so that, um, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. OK, so at the leaves, we have uh, bracket n. And at the root, we want to get to bracket s0. And roughly speaking, the ratio between adjacent uh, uh, s's here should be about l. Okay. So what this tells you is the depth of the tree is about log n divided by log l. OK, so uh, good. So how would the, the sieve proceed? Well, the leaf, at the leaf nodes, you're going to get some fresh length l uh, phase vector with multipliers in, in bracket n. And then you're going to, uh, in each internal node, you're going to collimate uh, its children. Okay, the child vectors at uh, the vectors at its two children. You collimate them, and that's going to cut down the size uh, or the interval of the multipliers by about an L factor. And you can do this in a variety of ways. You could do it uh, by uh, like a depth first search. So start with this, take this, collimate it to get that, handle these two, collimate it to get that, collimate those to get that, and so forth. Uh, you could do a depth uh, breadth first, which would be more parallel, but more uh, more memory requirements. Uh, you could do something in between. But this is the, the picture of the. Okay. And so the key insight, is, as I already mentioned, is the more Q Rackham we have, the larger we can take this L. And that's going to decrease the depth and thereby uh, require fewer vectors and uh, fewer oracle calls uh, at, uh, associated with the leaf. Uh, leaf nodes. So that's the that's the key uh, trick here. Okay. So I don't have too much time, right? A couple minutes. Um, five minutes. Okay. So let me tell you what a phase vector is, at least, and then um, and then we can go from there. So for the secret S, uh, here's a phase vector of length L. It's just some quantum state. Uh, where we're proportional to, uh, so we have L uh, cats here, basically. So we have a, a, a L basis vectors, basis elements. And then uh, associated to J, we have uh, a phase term, which is basically some B of J times S over N. Okay. And this B of J is known as the phase multiplier for J. So it's, there's just some function from L to, uh, let's say, bracket N, which just tells you what the phase multipliers are. Uh, so, for example, this is something we've already seen before in a special case, at least. Uh, if you invoke the oracle uh, that David told us about this morning, then you get a single qubit, uh, which looks like this. And it turns out this is really just a length two phase vector. So uh, b of zero is just zero, which gives you a phase of, of you know, just a factor of one here. And then, uh, and then you have this phase term here, which uh, is, has a multiplier of b prime. So. You know, if you in invoke the oracle, you get a length two phase vector of this special form. Um, and in general, we would store a larger phase uh, vectors. We know they're multipliers, so those are known classically. We would just store them in a sorted list. So it takes uh, you know quasi-linear in, in L number of bits to store those uh, phase multipliers, but only log L qubits for the, the quantum state itself. And this is basically the, the core of where the exponential improvement in uh, quantum space comes from. So um, this looks scary, but there's actually nothing going on here. Uh, we can take two phase vectors and combine them. You just tensor them together. Okay, then you get a new phase vector, essentially, a new phase vector with all um, pair sums of the phase multipliers of the two things. Okay, so it's just a big ugly equation, but nothing's really interesting going on here. So we have this new phase vector with uh, essentially now it's the product of the two lengths is its, is its length. And uh, the sums of its various phase multipliers are its new, are the new phase multipliers. So for example, if you take uh, a few uh, fresh qubits from the oracle and just tensor them together, you get this length two to the L phase vector and its multipliers are the subset sums of the individual labels. That's the simple thing you can do. More interestingly, 
you can do uh, what's called collimation. Collimation is the main, uh, main kind of procedure here behind the sieve. So I'll just show this uh, briefly. With collimation, you have two phase vectors. Let's suppose they have length L roughly, and they're on some large size S prime uh, interval. Their multipliers are from that interval. Then the goal is to combine them into one phase vector of roughly the same length, but on a significantly smaller interval. So S will now be cut down by about uh, an L factor. Okay, so the way we do this, well, we just tensor the phase vectors as I showed. This now gives you uh, a much longer phase vector, which has multipliers of the pair sums. And then you're gonna do uh, this very clever idea. You're gonna measure uh, this, this new combined phase vector according to the quotient of the multiplier divided by S and then round it. So what does this do? Well, it says basically it's gonna uh, kill off all the phase multipliers except for those which have this quotient with, uh, with S. And so the only surviving multipliers are those, uh, well, they're remainders basically. Remainders when divided by S are in this uh, interval S. There's some global phase which, which doesn't affect them. But basically all the surviving multipliers are now in this, this smaller interval. And then you have to do some bookkeeping uh, to make this a proper phase vector. Which I won't highlight, but. Uh, but the key point here is that if uh, this combined phase vector here has length L squared, um, its <coughs> multipliers are pretty well distributed of over 2S prime. And so heuristically, at least most of the size S subintervals here have about L multipliers in them. So when you do this measurement here, you're going to end up with uh, about L surviving multipliers, and um, they will effectively have, uh, they will effectively be in the interval S rather than S prime. Okay. And then step three is where the work is done. This requires some constant number of lookups into the Q Rackham of size L, and then uh, some quasi-linear uh, classical. Okay, so I will uh, skip the regularization and, me and uh, measurement part. But basically it says once you get a phase vector with very small multipliers, roughly the same size as the length, then you can do a QFT to extract uh, about log S bits of the secret. So you get several, actually by doing it this way, you get several bits of the secret out at a time, and then you can run the sieve more times uh, to get more of the bits of the secret out. So there's some practical issues that came up in the simulations. Uh, which are not terribly interesting from a theoretical point of view, but to make the thing actually run, uh, we have to address these. And I'll finish with the open questions. And I have a lot of the same questions that, that Chloe had from uh, before lunch. Um, so really the key question is like, what's the complexity of the, of the Seaside Oracle? We can now get uh, very good confidence on how many Oracle queries are needed uh, to, to run a full attack. But uh, you know, what do we know about the Oracle? Um, the existing estimates are not for the uniform distribution. Um, they're for a slightly non-uniform one. So can you bridge that gap? Or do you need to bridge that gap? Maybe the, not, maybe the slightly non-uniform is, is somehow good enough. Um, we have some evidence that um, you can handle the uniform distribution by reducing in a certain lattice where we have a lot of short relations that are known. So it'd be interesting to, to bound the overall cost and depth of, uh, of this, this kind of procedure that would actually give you the uniform distribution. Uh, and then I think an interesting question is, can you di more directly construct a quantum circuit for uh, the Seaside function? The existing constructions, you know, just build a classical circuit and then convert it generically. Um, I don't know th this, Maybe, this is, maybe there's nothing to this, but we're making a lot of Oracle calls. Can we amortize them some way? Can we get our initial phase vectors at least in some more clever way than just getting a bunch of individual qubits and combining them? Um, that would speed up things. Um, and then a separate question, which uh, I don't think has been raised before, is can we break Seaside using uh, partial information about the secret? Because when you run the sieve, you get log S bits out. Maybe it's 35 or something like that. So you get several bits out. Uh, our estimates for the number of Oracle calls are for recovering almost all the bits of the secret, but maybe getting half of the bits is enough to break the scheme. I mean, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of schemes don't do well under secret key leakage, partial leakage. 
So that would also cut down uh, the number of uh, Oracle calls you have to make. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I'll have to say. Thank you. Oh, if you want to run the code, you, there it is. You can run the code. Thanks a lot. Do we have any have a quick question? Well, thanks again, Chris. And, uh